Some of you may have seen a recent book that came out about the, the merger of US Airways and American Airlines, written by Dan Reed and Ted Reed. If you haven't seen it, it's an interesting uh, read, excuse the pun, um, because we know many of the actors involved, of course. And one of the actors in the book, heavily referenced in the book, is Bill Frankie, our speaker today. Um, and in fact, one, one comment particularly intrigued me, where the authors write that uh, when Bill was a CEO at what was America West Airlines, Bill recruited six out of the seven current top management at American Airlines. If you look at all the management of American Airlines, Doug Parker, Scott Kirby, etc., six out of the seven top management at the world's biggest airlines were recruited to uh, their jobs by Bill Frankie when they were at America West. So although some of you may be wondering who Bill Frankie is, that statement alone can tell you that this is the guy who is a mover and shaker in our industry. Um, Bill is formerly the managing partner of Indigo Partners LLC, a, a company that he founded. Indigo is a private equity firm focused on acquisitions and strategic investments in aerospace, airlines, and related industries. Bill has extensive experience in the airline industry, both as an investor and an executive. As I said, he was CEO at America West Airlines. He was chairman of Spirit Airlines. He was the founding chairman at Tiger Airways. He was a pre-IPO investor in Ryanair, and he was a founder of Hotwire, the travel internet site. Bill is currently the chairman of Wizz Air Limited in Hungary, a Hungarian low-cost carrier. He's the director of the Mexican airline Volaris, and he's chairman of Frontier Airlines here in Denver. So as you gather from that, Bill is a busy man. In fact, Bill very rarely um, comes out to give speeches, so we're very privileged and honored to have Bill with us here today. He's also on the board of directors of several different public companies in a variety of different industries. Another quote from Dan and Ted Reed's book um, is talking about an interview with Bill a couple of years ago where he talks about how difficult it is to be successful as a leader in the airline business. And I, I forget the exact quote, Bill, I'm gonna paraphrase it. It was something along the lines of, uh, you work really hard to get as many things as you can right, and if you get 75% right, that's a pretty good track record. So I know Bill, I know Bill quite well, and I know that Bill demands a lot more than just 75% from his airlines, I can, and from his suppliers for that matter as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bill Frankie. Well, uh, good afternoon everyone, glad to be here and, and to share a few remarks. The remarks will be fairly brief, and I would hope at the conclusion there'll be time for questions and answers, and I'd be, I'm a pretty candid guy, so you can uh, ask me pretty much anything, except my brand of underwear or something like that. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Barry in particular for having me here. Uh, Barry, I left Phoenix, it was 75 degrees, uh, and uh, I arrive here to this weather, so uh, I have to thank you for thinking of me. Maybe you can reciprocate by coming to visit me in Arizona in, in August, uh, <laughs> at which point you will not need that sweater, I can guarantee you. Well, the, the uh, comments that were made by uh, Barry at the outset describe a career that's gone uh, uh, across all segments, both uh, operations and finance, and now from an investment perspective. And it's been, it's been a, uh, an enjoyable run. I actually made my first appearance here at the Wings Club uh, in 1997. So it's gratifying to know that the buzz of that speech was so strong that I got invited back 18 years later. Uh, <laughs> and I guess on that basis, uh, I'll see you guys all again in 2033 or the, uh, or the likes. Well, in 1997, I was here as chairman and chief executive officer of America West Airlines. Back then, America West barely qualified to call itself a major carrier, but today, it's the world's largest airline. Okay, as Barry noted, you might uh, think of it as American Airlines, but beneath the American livery beats the heart of America West, which took on the U.S. Airways name after engineering a merger with it in 2005, and then took on the American Airlines name after beginning uh, engineering the merger in 2013. As uh, Barry noted, six of the seven senior executives were hired at America West during my time there, and the seventh Barry had been interviewed at the time I, uh, I uh, left the company. Well, in 2002, I formed uh, Indigo Partners. I left uh, America West on, if you think about this now, on August 31st, 2001. And we had a big press conference and introduced Doug Parker as the new CEO. 
We did a little television, Mutt and Jeff, and it was great stuff. And I got on the plane and went to Australia. And of course, 11 days later, all hell broke loose. And Doug and the team did a really remarkable job of sustaining the airline during extremely difficult circumstances. But in 2002, I formed the firm, and my objective was to invest in private equity into the airline sector. I got to tell you the truth, most people thought I was nuts. I can't tell you how many times I heard the saying properly attributed to Warren Buffett to the effect that you become a millionaire by starting with a billion dollars and investing in an airline. I mean, I heard that people couldn't wait to tell me that over and over. And, and in fact, our two funds have had a 42% internal rate of return and a net return of 33%. So I think even Warren would be pleased with uh, that return. Our portfolio features or has included several successful new generation low cost carriers, including Wizz Air in Europe and Volaris in Mexico. We've also successfully exited investments in Tiger Airways in Singapore and Spirit Airlines in the United States. And about a year ago, we acquired Frontier Airlines uh, based in Denver. For, for about 25 years now, I've been involved in the management of low cost airlines around the world. During this time, I've learned a few lessons and I'll be brief, but explain them to you. The first and most important lesson when you invest in this segment, in the low cost segment, is cost. You have to find a competitive cost advantage. We did that at Spirit, we took Spirit's cost down and we're working that same path with Frontier. Uh, and I'm, uh, in today, as you think about it, in the low cost segment in particular, flights under four hours, uh, a seat is a seat is a seat, it's a commodity. And in a commodity business, low cost wins. So we have been very focused in our carriers and investments we've made uh, to ensure that when customers are faced with uh, two reasonably similar products, we know they're going to choose the one with the lowest price. That implies that you have to have the lowest cost. The second thing is it takes an incredible amount of discipline to accomplish that simple statement about having low cost. You can't believe how many inefficiencies you find in airlines that have been flying for a number of years. We acquired Spirit had been in the air back, what, 14 years, I think, at the time we made our investment. And it had been a marginal carrier making or losing money. And when we decided at that time to convert it to the low cost model, um, it takes an amazing amount of commitment and, and, and uh, I guess, you have to be pretty tough-minded, uh, to be polite about it, with your management team around getting the cost structure where it needs to be. If you're a startup, and we've invested in startups, uh, Wizz Air is a good example of that, they as a general rule don't have sufficient capital, can't as a result get adequate seats to the market, can't buy or finance aircraft properly, and have to develop a brand and customer loyalty. So there's more work to do. Matching your business model to the market and your customer is another critical step. There are myriads of cases of airlines that misjudge their market, overspec their aircraft, things like too much BFE, IFE, wrong interior seat products, the addition of such things as mood lighting, all come to mind. It's our job as investors to make sure that management builds an airline tailored to the market, not to the personal ambition of the management team. I think it was uh, Lord Marshall who said something to the effect that when we board an airplane, our instinct is to turn left but the market turns right, and that's, uh, that's exactly the fact. The underpinnings of the model I just mentioned, ensuring a competitive cost advantage, being disciplined, and knowing your market are critical, but they're not all that you need to do. You have to have a good management team. You have to have uh, a committed management team. At Indigo, we've learned that even as an active investor who takes control positions, we can only do so much. Day-to-day -day decisions are the responsibility of the management team, and sometimes decisions that seem minor at the time can have long and lasting consequences. This is doubly important when it comes to building a culture of cost discipline and customer service. The responsibility to develop that culture lies with management. The way we work is we work with the management to create the vision. We want to have a vision of the business. We then want to develop with them the strategy to attain that vision and the development of the tactics to support that strategy and affect the annual business plan. But we then expect management to manage against the business plan. 
we follow their progress and sometimes we follow their lack of progress and are quite interested, as you might imagine, in their results. We're here to help with major decisions like aircraft orders, aircraft finance, major industry relationships, and we try to be as helpful as we can to each of our portfolio companies. Uh, I've been involved in acquiring more than 500 uh, narrow-body aircraft. We, as a result, know how to acquire the aircraft. We know how to price the aircraft. We know how to spec the aircraft. And we're quite familiar with financial markets. All those things are not intuitive to the actual, to the, to the usual uh, CEO or, or management of an airline. They've been involved in other aspects. And I'm sorry, Barry, but uh, airlines in general overpay for aircraft. So you, you have to be really focused on, on uh, uh, on those aspects. And so we, we try to run them, but at the end of the day, we can't run the airline day to day and we don't make any effort to do it. Uh, my schedule as it is is, is uh, mind boggling, to me anyway, and uh, we, we just couldn't provide that day to day coverage, so we have to have quality, uh, focused management in our, in our airlines. And the good news is, if you're an Indigo senior airline manager and you help the airline along the agreed, the agreed path, and we reach a liquidity event, like in the case of Spirit, the public offering. We are quick to share the financial results with the management, and those amounts can, in fact, be substantial. So we, we also inevitably, and in, in some of our investments have uh, minority partners, and sometimes they are at least nominally majority partners, depending on the law of the jurisdiction. Most of the world, a foreigner can only own 49% of an airline. There are a lot of limitations of it even further that say you can't own more than 24.5% in a single investor. So you have to understand all of the rules of the road and you have to design your investment around uh, uh, those rules. We also think that good partners can provide uh, uh, help in the local market. So we, we like to have strong local partners who have either political connections, regulatory connections, uh, financial connections, who know the business and uh, can understand uh, uh, the needs of, of the business. For example, when we established Tiger Airways in 2004, our partners were Singapore Airlines and Tomasic Holdings, uh, and you can imagine how invaluable they were to uh, the success of that airline. You couldn't ask for better partners. <clears throat> but we've also learned the flip side. We made an investment in a Russian budget carrier that went south when the majority partner blocked the airline's management out AK-47s in hand, and what was a Russian version of a coup d'etat, and uh, while we were richer for the experience, we were also $50 million poor at the bank. So you have to be thoughtful about, as I said, the cost structure, the management, and how you manage yourself against uh, your local environment. We're, as you think about our sector, we're essentially investors in asset light uh, businesses as we rely on third parties to provide many of the services such as uh, line and heavy maintenance and ground handling. It's much easier to have a successful investment when those services are operating at peak efficiency and your airline management is doing what they do best, which is to run the airline. We also have to deal with regulatory constraints. While governments often claim that regulations are in the best interests of the consumer, they generally have the opposite effect. It's critical to ensure that strong, rational, legal, and regulatory frameworks are in place to protect your investment. So we take a hard look at the regulatory environment, and where possible, I arrange to meet with senior members of the government or the regulators that we'll be dealing with. And whether it's the, uh, I've met with the president of countries and prime ministers, and we try to be very thoughtful about being good investors and good partners, but to know our partners and the regulatory environment. And of course you have to deal in some of the jurisdictions where we work with uh, corruption and you find yourself competing against state-owned airlines, all of which can prove a challenge. Well, even with these roadblocks, the low-cost model is enjoying success. Ultra-low-cost carriers in particular will continue to grow along with the emerging global middle class and as it grows, the ultra-low-cost model will certainly continue to evolve. My roommate, Herb Kelleher, oh, you say, I didn't know he was your roommate. Well, actually, Herb and I have been roommates for about 15 years, and we're the ultimate odd couple, frickin' frack. But it's a long story I won't share with you today. But Herb has uh, famously created the business model for Southwest Airlines on a cocktail napkin, once said, quote, I've always tried to look a little bit ahead, at least when I'm sober. And when I'm not, I look way ahead. <laughs> So 
So in the spirit of Herb, let's look a little bit about the future of commercial aviation in the ultra low cost model. As you know, the U.S. airline industry has undergone a period of unprecedented consolidation, and consolidation has created an incredible amount of opportunity for low-cost airlines. As costs crept up in the wake of consolidation, room was created for the ultra-low-cost carrier to take advantage of the growing cost gap. That's where you'll find airlines like Spirit and Allegiant over on the right, and where we're trying to move Frontier. You have to avoid the quagmire that Amazon founder Jeff Bezos described when he said, quote, we were hoping to build a small, profitable company, and of course what we've done is build a large, unprofitable company. And, and you have to be focused that that's not where you end up. We've tried hard to transfer Frontier into the next phase of the ultra-low-cost carrier. Fortunately, we've already had some success in engineering a significant turnaround at Spirit Airlines. When we made a majority equity investment in Spirit in 2006, the airline was experiencing growing pains and was struggling to support an unwieldy cost structure. We made a priority of lowering costs while building up the airline's viability in the marketplace. We moved operations from Detroit to Fort Lauderdale, reinforced the route system with a stronger north-south east coast flying, greatly expanded Caribbean and Latin American presence, implemented unbundled revenue strategy, and phased out an aging MD-80 fleet in favor of an all Airbus fleet. When we exited Spirit in 2013, it was a different airline with a much stronger financial and operating environment. From the time we acquired Spirit in 2006 until 2013 when we exited, annual passenger traffic increased from 5 million passenger segments to 12.4 million. Revenue grew from 543 million to more than 1.6 billion. Net income increased from a loss of 81 million to a profit of 177 million and we took unrestricted cash from 4 million to 531 million. We also cut cost for available seat mile, including excluding fuel, from 6.89 cents to 5.91 cents. So Ben Baldanza and Barry Biffle and the Spirit Management team deserve a lot of credit for putting up with me and executing this business plan properly. They did a great job. It's good now, by the way, to have Barry at Frontier as its president. Spirit has done a lot of things right. It was tremendously successful investment for us, and it continues to be one of the most profitable carriers in the United States. But we learned from some missteps there that we're working to avoid with Frontier. At Spirit, and this was our fault, we didn't communicate with customers and employees as effectively as we could about the transition from a legacy to a low-cost model. We don't want that to happen at Frontier. For example, we purchased a substantial amount of television advertising to educate our local market about the new low-cost model. And we're working hard to educate our employees, an equally important part of this process, on the benefits of what we call low fares done right. We want to be as transparent as possible during this transition so customers know exactly what to expect by delivering the kind of service that builds customer loyalty. Historically, many low-cost carriers have come up short managing customer service. This was another issue at Spirit we never fully solved, and we learned a valuable lesson about customer communication that we're trying to apply at Frontier. As we continue to move ahead with the transition, we want to ensure that Frontier never loses the Rocky Mountain friendliness that it's known for. Customer goodwill is an asset you cannot put a price on. As you know, we put a strong emphasis on customer choice at Spirit. Despite the current popularity of unbundled fares, we recognize there's still a group of travelers who want a bundled fare and an ancillary package. And there's nothing wrong with that, provided the airline prices it appropriately. At Frontier, we offer, as a result, a convenient, fully bundled fare in addition to the unbundled fare. We call that Classic Plus. It's priced at a slight premium and allows the fare and ancillary services to be purchased as a bundle package Market acceptance of this, project, of this uh, uh, concept has been uh, remarkably strong. So there is a large group, and probably most of the people in this room, who do not want to take the time to sort through the cafeteria style of unbundled fares, but are willing to pay more to simply take the ticket, get on the plane, and have, it, have the service provided. Operational excellence is central to Frontier's low-cost proposition. We want to run a safe, punctual air, uh, airline. That's important for travelers, but it's also important for the operations of the airline. We have very high asset utilization requirements for the model. All of our airlines fly somewhere between 11 to 13 hours a day. 
We simply can't afford to run later cancel flights. At the same time, we can't pad block times. So we have to have a much more intense focus on operations and uh, something that we in the low-cost area have to pay particular attention to because we all run what you would think of as skinny network systems. Uh, we don't have six, eight flights to a particular market. You might have one or two, and as a result, you have to be very focused on your operation. Well, so far, the approach with Frontier is encouraging. According to DOT Form 41 data, it's all I'm permitted to give you, for the first nine months of 2014, Frontier had revenue of 1.17 billion, up 15.7% over the same period in the previous year. Unit costs are down more than 13%. And as you would expect, net income grew considerably, reaching $103.6 million as compared to less than $10 million during the same period in the prior year. So we're significantly advanced in the airline's cost reduction and expect to be cost competitive with other ULCCs later this year. The, the, the uh, cross, where airlines become an ultra low cost carrier is when their, their chasm X fuel uh, is six cents or below. And I'll, uh, I can say, because it's public information, that when we acquired Frontier, its uh, chasm X fuel was approaching seven and a half cents, and its current run rate is, uh, is uh, much closer to the 6% and on the way there. Looking back at recent and not so recent history, I think it's safe to say that change is the only constant in the airline industry. Commercial aviation will continue to evolve, but even in the face of change I'm, change, I'm confident that the ultra low cost model is here to stay. As the middle class continues to grow on a global basis, the model makes more and more sense for a global market. We see opportunities elsewhere in the world for the model, and you can expect to read about our entry in other markets. If any, if history tells us anything about av commercial aviation, it has to adapt to survive. And those carriers stuck in the gap between the low-cost guys and the legacy guys could find themselves on the wrong side of that history. In closing, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity, Barry, to uh, speak to the group. I'm hoping that uh, perhaps there'll be an opportunity somewhere in advance of the next 18 years. And thank you all. Thank you all very much. I'm going to present Bill with the usual plaque to uh, express our appreciation for him coming to join us here in the freezing cold of New York from sunny, warm Phoenix. Bill, thank you very much for your help.